What's your EQ, your empathy quotient? How empathetic are you toward animals? And if you know that cows and donkeys can grieve, what about spiders? Anthropologist Barbara J. King, an animal emotion and cognition expert, explains why it matters. Next on The PETA Podcast. Welcome to The PETA Podcast. I'm Emil Guillermo, your host for this inside look at animal rights. Brought to you by PETA, the largest animal rights organization in the world. On today's episode, philosophers asking if animals suffer was the question that led to establishing what we know of as animal rights. Now, animal emotion and cognition expert like Barbara J. King broadens the question and explores how animals have feelings and are capable of grief. And if they do, why are humans capable of treating animals so poorly? Here's my conversation with author Barbara King on how her research could help us understand the ways we fail in compassion and empathy toward the animals on the PETA podcast. I was very excited to do my original dissertation research in Kenya where I work to figure out how baboon infants learn what to eat. They have many, many options on the savanna, and I watch them as they learn how to eat. Then in the last 10 years or so, I shifted a little bit. So I'm interested in how animals express emotions like love and grief. How do we know when we're watching them that their cues are telling us this may be how they're feeling? Because what I see in animals is that, in fact, their social and emotional lives are, are complicated. They experience highs and lows every day like we do, joys and traumas, and that has become the focus of my work. So love and grief, why those two areas? What is it about that that is most expressive about how complex the animals are? Well, I think they're two sides of the same coin. Animals and their families and their societies, of course, form what we used to call, when I was in graduate school, strong bonds. And I think that it's much more, and, and in fact, more scientifically rigorous to call them what they are. They form friendships and they feel love. And this attracts me because I think it shows us the real profound nature of how much animals feel. And the sad part of that is, as it is in our lives as well, that if a loved one dies, then there is uh, an expression of, of such, such sadness that I think the word grief is, is well called for, is what we need to, to use to express what these animals are saying. Um, so sometimes people say to me, how, how can you read an animal's mind? And of course, that's not what I'm doing. I'm looking very carefully at how animals express themselves through their behavior and their cues are there. So my definition of grief is very much predicated on what an animal is telling us. And a lot of it is maybe there is a kind of bias thinking that animals, not you, but most people think that animals aren't that complex, are really very simple and aren't capable of emotion or aren't capable of the kind of feelings that you're trying to uncover? Yes, I think that's part of it. Uh, thankfully, in the last couple of decades, the pendulum has been swinging more towards acceptance of animals as more complicated beings, and that is entirely accurate. There is still some resistance in scientific circles to this, which I find um, shocking and uh, sort of fascinating. But the world is getting better in understanding that animals do think and do feel. And there's a whole lot of scientists we have to thank for that and activists as well. And why do you say shocking? I don't understand how anyone at this point can deny the existence of animal emotions. And I should, I should qualify this. I'm not talking about every single animal species on the planet. I'm not talking about every single animal species on the planet when I speak about emotions because we know that most animals are 
uh, invertebrates and beetles and, you know, all kinds of insects and arachnids. And I, I don't know about their life experience. But certainly for reptiles, amphibians, birds, mammals, we have um, every reason to think that what we see and interpret as emotions is, is accurate. So for scientists to to turn away from this and to try to explain it away as being, say, anthropomorphism, the projection of animal onto animals of human emotions, it, it's just um, it's very surprising to me. Uh, I wonder if some scientists do continue to deny emotions to animals because it's more convenient for their work. And what I mean by this is if your work is predicated on keeping animals in laboratories and experimenting on them, then it is highly inconvenient to have to think every day about animal grief, sadness, the capacity for joy that is denied them in, in laboratories and that kind of thing. So I do think in some cases it is simply too hard for scientists to want to look at the full spectrum of animal emotions. This doesn't include everyone, but I do believe it is a factor. Do you think overall that that kind of attitude might mar some of the science that comes out of, you know, in, in these areas? Oh, most certainly. I don't think it's possible for an animal held captive in a laboratory to be herself or to be himself, to feel or express uh, a good part of the spectrum of emotions that animals will feel and express when allowed to be themselves in the wild. So the science is bad, and, and then the emotions get denied. So it is a lose-lose all around. Now, this is pretty clear to someone like yourself who does this research. Is it clear to the people who are actually doing that kind of research? I don't know. I really couldn't talk about how much they know and deny versus what they just don't see. But, you know, a large part of, of my writing recently has been about the, the need to really see what goes on in biomedical laboratories where animals are held. And part of what we need to see is that animals are prevented from expressing who they are. That includes their ability to think, to problem solve, to reason, to feel grief, to feel sadness, to feel joy. And so, however it comes about, a very poor science in laboratories because the animals are not themselves, and then it, it just sort of closes off the ability to understand the animal for who he actually is. So the true nature of the animal is missing and in those situations, but you have discovered some of that from your observations in terms of love and grief. I think that some people who have companion dogs might know that when a dog has lost a human or a dog friend, that the grief is fairly obvious. Uh, can you tell us about a species that grieves that might surprise us that we wouldn't ordinarily think has that, that feeling of love or grief? There are so many examples that I could discuss, but I'm going to pick a donkey. And I should say that PETA listeners might not be surprised that donkeys feel profound emotions, but a lot of the world would be because, you know, donkeys are very often mischaracterized as stubborn and braying and just not very bright. So I think that this does surprise a lot of people. A couple of years ago, I was contacted by some staff members at an animal sanctuary in Alberta, Canada, they had taken in a donkey named Lena, and Lena was the only donkey there in this particular sanctuary, so she was lonely at first, but very happily, she became quite close friends with a horse. The horse was a bit older. The horse was named Jake, and they had three years of incredibly close friendship, so they really did everything together. And then at 32 years of age, the horse, Jake, fell very badly ill, and it was the humane and the right thing to do to euthanize him. And here is where the really poignant uh, scenario comes in, because Lena watched uh, Jake being buried out in a field, and then she went and climbed on top of his burial mound and simply stood there she cried out, she didn't leave, she didn't eat, she didn't want to come in to sleep to the barn. And this went on for days. 
And this really affected me when I learned about this because it fit precisely with my definition of animal grief. A survivor alters his or her behavior uh, through social withdrawal, failure to eat or sleep in some way around a death, and that's what, what Lena did. And I'm happy to say that over some weeks, her grief did and she began to recover, but there's no question in my mind that this was grief. This wasn't just some kind of, um, you know, upset at a change in routine or, or some stress for some other reason. This was very much sadness at the loss of her friend, and that really touched my heart quite a bit. Now, some people might say, surely there could be another reason for mm-hmm. her behavior, sure. right? And, mm-hmm. and there was no question in your mind, though. No, not at all. I think it is possible in some cases to explain away animal grief. You know, I have by now hundreds of examples. It is possible to come up with alternative hypotheses, as we call them in science, but I think that it's really a kind of desperate stretch to do that, whereas it is, and I emphasize this quite a bit, it is better science to apply a definition of grief, look for it, and document when it's there rather than trying to find other explanations. So sometimes, you know, I'm, I'm not always sure when I'm seeing grief. It's not that every single time I encounter an animal who is a survivor or watch a video or read an account that I can come out and say that's absolutely grief. But I think in the case of Lena, the prolonged nature of her behavior, the location in which she chose to grieve on top of her friend's grave, and the severity of the social withdrawal and the failure to take care of herself was quite marked and quite clear. And so the significance of identifying that grief and say, in terms of, in in your mind, that this was, in fact, grief. What, what is the significance of that? Oh, I think there's a couple of areas that I find significant. One is, is that since, of course, I multiply this example across many species, it helps us as humans to realize, you know, who we're sharing our planet with. We know, we should know, we should see that the animals all around us feel and think. And so this could, I hope, give us a sense of hope and comfort. You know, it's sad to think that animals grieve this way, but after all, if it is predicated on and emerging from love, that's quite wonderful. So we have co-travelers, if you will, on this earth who feel deeply. And to me, that's a beautiful thing to know to know that we're alive as human beings in this community of other feeling, thinking beings. The second thing, though, the most important thing to my mind is that this is a guidepost for how we humans need to realize that we need to treat animals far better than we do. As PETA always says, animals are not here for us. They're not ours to use. And when animals show themselves through their ability to think and feel, that brings the message home to us. I'd like to continue and talk about this a little more because I don't want to be misunderstood. I don't want it to come out sounding like we only need to treat well those animals who think and feel in ways that we can recognize. No, not at all. We need to be compassionate to all beings. Um, I can talk a little bit later perhaps about spiders, how much I love them and how much I want to, to care for them. And we don't know that they grieve, for example. The work on grief has touched people around the world really the most profoundly. And I, I think people are hungry to know that we do have other beings around us who experience these these ups and downs in life, and they're hungry to know how to help. So I was very excited to be asked to give a TED Talk a couple of years ago at the annual TED conference in Vancouver, and I spoke about this work. And what surprised me the most was that when I got to talking about how we need to treat animals better, that is when the audience clapped. And that just made me 
very heartened. You know, I was saying, if we know that elephants grieve, and we do, let's work harder against trophy hunting. If we know that monkeys and apes grieve, and we do, let's get them out of biomedical laboratories. And I could go on and on. You know, with all the animals we eat, dairy cows grieve, for example. Let's not eat them. Let's not use their milk. This is the message to me that comes out of this work on emotion. Right. So we're fellow travelers. We are on this planet together. We should be more aware of these and we should take better care on how we relate to these animals in some of these other uses. We take calves away from cows. That's got to be uh, maybe not grief, but there's got to be some emotion there when we have that sense of maternal deprivation in our dairy industry. Oh, very much so. I think about and write about dairy cows very frequently. And I would go as so far as to say that mothers feel grief. These dairy cows are continuously impregnated so that they will continue to produce milk. And the milk that is meant for their babies is then taken away for humans. So in order for the cycle to continue, the the young calves have to be separated from the mothers. And many, many times, the separation might as well be a death if it isn't a death to the mother from the mother's point of view. What the mother knows is that again and again and again, her children are taken from her. Sometimes they're, the calves are killed, right? The young males are taken to veal farms and killed. The young um, female calves may be kept on the farm and put into the same cycle of milk production. But from the point of view of the mom, it is grief, and we know this. I've seen films. I've talked to, to animal activists who have seen these dairy cows wailing and crying for their young, and it is something that we need to recognize and that we, we can change. And so why does the industry do it that way? Just for expedience, for profit, and, and without a care or thought when it comes to the animals? Why, why? Well, it comes down to it comes down to production numbers. How much milk can we produce in the most efficient and rapid manner? And according to that calculus, then the best thing to do is to just keep producing as much milk for humans as possible. Now, of course, I don't um, drink cow milk and I, I, I use non-dairy products. And uh, I think there are a lot of people across the world who are really, really catching on to this. So I'm hoping that that economic strategy of the dairy industry is on uh, a great trajectory towards failure because people are realizing this is not acceptable and we are beginning to change what we accept. When you do the kind of research that you do on love and grief and when this kind of information does become more widely known and widely ex accepted, do you think it will have the impact of changing how industry relates to animals? I think it will have a change. I think that our collective impact will make a difference. But I'm not sure if the change is going to come about because suddenly industry, you know, finds a heart and decides that it needs to express compassion, or if it's just going to be the fact that the world changes by choosing different products. In other words, we are moving more and more towards plant-based eating to non-dairy-based eating. So there will be a change in the world. Of that, I have no doubt. But I think that the impetus is going to come from us, consumers, who refuse to accept the animal cruelty in animal agriculture. As we adjust the industry will adjust and take the cue from us and it won't be any have anything to do with compassion, uh, only compassion for their dying profits, I guess. Yeah, you're right. I like the way you put that. And, you know, I, I may sound cynical, but certainly these industries have had, you know, many years to step up to the plate and show compassion for animals. And I have not been impressed by what I've seen. So I think the responsibility is, is on us and, that the study of animal emotion is one tool in the toolbox, if you will. There are many, many reasons to act with compassion for animals and not to eat them. But the storytelling that I do as a scientist and that many other scientists join with me in doing is, I think, helpful and motivating for people to move away from that kind of animal cruelty. Well, let's forget about the industry that you abuses and uses animals and go back to that other industry that uses and abuses animals. 
the scientific research community. What is the impact of your research on that industry? Yes, animals and biomedical laboratories, I think, are less well understood than animals in caught up in agricultural systems. So what I mean by this is more and more people are aware of the cruelty that comes along with especially industrial farming. But the biomedical community has been astonishingly successful at a lack of transparency about what's going on in their laboratories. So I think that what a number of us are trying to do is to over and over again expose through talking the life history of what these beings have to go through. So there is a commonality here in talking not just an abstraction about, you know, billions of animals used for food or billions of animals used in the biomedical laboratories. We need to make this real for people and talk about individuals. And I do that in my book and I do that in some of the essays that I've been writing more recently. One of the animals that I've been talking about a lot is a macaque, a monkey, called Cornelius, who was held, has been held for over 10 years in a research laboratory in Wisconsin. And I found out about this animal through the undercover exploration work, hard work of, of PETA. And I've been writing about Cornelius because he is one depressed and sad monkey who has been used in invasive experiments, of course, through no consent of his own. So what I want to be able to do is to have people think about two things. One, that every day, hour by hour, we have over 75,000 monkeys in this country held in these terrible conditions in laboratories, not to mention, you know, very, very many rats and mice and ferrets and cats and dogs and octopus. And secondly, that we do, just like we have a choice in what we eat, we have a choice in terms of what science we support. We know that there are alternative ways to do science that actually are better science for helping people who are sick or who need pharmaceuticals. We can support new technologies that are human tissue based that don't use animals at all and they're more accurate as well as being more ethical. So for example, organs on the chip that your listeners may well have heard of, there are these small thumb sized drive little pieces of of a technology where human liver cells or kidney cells or lung cells can be grown and subjected to different conditions so that we are experimenting on human cells because we know that animal models don't work very well. They fail continuously. Right. Well, you know, a lot of your colleagues or a lot of the members of the scientific research community, they know about all these methods, most of them. Uh, and yet, they aren't changing on their own. Why is that if some of this is widely known in the scientific community? Well, as an anthropologist, I'd have to say that it's a cultural system that is really deeply ingrained. And by this, I mean, supposedly, this is the line that we're fed, supposedly animal models are necessary for good science. Now, this is not true, but yet the grant system that has grown up around this false claim is the way to get funded and the way to continue research right now at NIH, at universities across the country, is to propose research that uses animals. And this is what we have to change through making lots of grants available for younger people using human science and not animal science to change the culture where these committees, you know, of grant approval keep re repeating their, their sort of admiration for this cultural system. I think it is a, a, an idea that we have to change through education, through graduate study that makes it very clear that the system as it is, is not working for anyone. And then this puts also some of the onus on the public and, and its outcry uh, to the scientific community and the government funding of, of their, of their work with animals. So uh, let's turn to your recent book, Animals Best Friends, Putting Compassion to Work for Animals in Captivity and in the Wild, which was released recently. You share your very personal journey. We've talked about bits of that. Tell us why it was so important for you to write the book right now. I think there are so many animal lovers out in the world who want to do well by animals. 
and they may know how to help the animals in their homes, their companions, their cats, dogs, rabbits, but it's not always easy to know how to go bigger than that, how to make a difference for animals that are caught up in some of these larger systems that we've been talking about, including science and agriculture. So I wanted to write a book that crossed contexts. In other words, yes, I do talk about animals in the home, but I talk also about wild animals, animals held in zoos, animals thought to be food, and then the animals held in scientific laboratories. And to say, look, we have to look head on at the harms that are occurring to these animals and then turn them into opportunities to help. And I didn't want the book to be grim. You know, you have to look at the harms, but also what I am talking about is how the more I devote myself in in the small ways that I can to helping animals, the more joy I feel in my life. And that really has been the personal journey. And I wanted to say to people, look, here are some ideas, chapter by chapter, for what we can all do. And I promise you that although it's hard at times to be with animals and to know that you're helping animals through daily compassion is totally transformative. And that's really the basis of the book. And really, if the animals could talk, we would know exactly what they're thinking and what they're feeling. But your studies have done, have gone into this other area where you have observed real feelings real grief, real, real love. And that in a way is like hearing the animals talk. Yes. And I'm glad you said that because I have been including in a lot of my public talks, um, a question to people, do you really believe that animals are voiceless? And I ask that because there's a meme going around saying, you know, stand up for the voiceless, speak for the voiceless, speak for animals. But animals aren't voiceless. They don't have human language, nor do we have chimpanzee language or spider language. So, okay. But every single day, they do tell us through their behavior that they want to live. They want to live safely. They want to live without pain. They want to flourish. This may be expressed in different ways according to one's taxonomic group, but that really doesn't matter. It is what's important to me as a commonality. So I do try to say that if we still ourselves and we look and we see animals for who they are, this is an important first step. So there's things we can do every single day, not only who we don't eat, not eating animals, not eating animal products, but how we choose to entertain ourselves, how we can turn our yards into little ecological sanctuaries, you know, on and on and on. And this can be good for all of us as a kind of win-win. Yeah, and your research really exposes just how much we don't know and how we've gotten it wrong all along. And we make these assumptions that certainly these animals are subhuman, but that doesn't mean they are without a way of communication, a way of, of, of uh, having feelings and expressing grief. Yes, I like the term other than human animals. I mean, we're all animals, of course. And the, a term like subhuman tends to set up humans as the standard, which I'd like to kind of get away from. So we're a community of animals expressing ourselves in different ways. And this is why I'm careful not to say that all animals grieve. I don't believe that. I don't think we have any evidence to suggest that. And again, I think about all the wonderful insects and arachnids that you know I have come to observe and to understand. And it doesn't matter to me that they don't grieve. They also have lives that matter in and of themselves. Now, it is true that I don't rescue ticks and I don't rescue fleas and I do draw a line, but I have come to understand that it's an act of compassion to take a spider from one's house and put it out in the yard if the temperatures are right, to leave the spider in the house if the spider is non-venomous and it's too hot or too cold outside, that these small lives all around us matter just as much as do the lives of animals where we know there's grief and love. Now, I, I know you have this thing for spiders. You mentioned arachnids. I do. I, I mentioned arach- You mentioned arachnids, and I was going to, 
jump in with the spider thing, but then you did. Tell me more about the spiders. You wrote an essay about spiders. They are often misunderstood as these really, uh, well, they, they, they invoke fear in people. People are afraid of them, right? Yes, many people are afraid of spiders, and also many people are just simply creeped out by them without being necessarily phobic. They just don't like the looks of, you know, all those legs. And I'm in a way very empathetic because I grew up being afraid of spiders, and in my home, in my childhood home, we would routinely kill spiders without a second thought. And that was such an irony, I now think. You know, we had cats and loved them, and we'd kill spiders, and we thought that made sense, and it doesn't really. So a couple of years ago, and I do write about this in my latest book, I think it was maybe 10 years ago now, I was home alone and two wolf spiders appeared in my bathroom and I took off a shoe and I killed them and I flushed them down the toilet. And that upset me so much as soon as I did it. That was just, um, there was no reason for me to do that. And it became a turning point. And so I challenged myself to learn about spiders and to watch spiders. And I started with the cute little jumping spiders that one can find in the yard. They're very small. People find them adorable, and and some people keep them as pets, although I do not. And from there, I kind of graduated to watching the orb weaver spiders that come to my part of Virginia every late summer. I watch them weave their webs and catch their prey and mate and do all these things, and it just became fascinating. So I could... Stop thinking in the abstract about spiders and see a big, big theme in my work. And I never would kill a spider now. Um, Sometimes I get a little startled by them still, but I can override that and rescue them. And that has been a big change in my life. You know, I had the same experience when I noticed ants on my, on my, uh, on my table and, they were carrying bits of breadcrumb and Uh when I was, and then when, when I got kind of upset with them and I may have smashed one or two or sprayed, sprayed them down with water or something Uh and it stunned him. And I saw ants picking up the bodies and taking Uh them back to the, I guess the main home or the nest or wherever, you know, whatever they called home which showed to me that there was some feeling for their fellow, for for their fellow ants. There is a response to death in ants. Um, I could not tell you as as a non entomologist, whether this is completely chemically mediated or whether it is emotionally mediated. But I think your point is the same either way. And it reinforces the point that I'm saying that we don't need animals to be like us to act with compassion for them. We observe their behaviors. We may not fully understand what's going on, but we can see that they have a worked out system for how to deal with their dead. And that can touch us, whatever that system is rooted in. Just to wrap up, if you were, just a final question, if you were to sit next to someone on a plane or somewhere and someone you had never met before and you had a few minutes to tell them the three most important ways that they could help animals, What would you say? Well, first, I'd wait for them to ask me (laughs) um, because I don't just go around speechifying. But if they did ask me, number one, absolutely, to the best of your ability, eat fewer or no animals. Number one thing to do to help animals is not to eat them, not to eat animal products. And I just emphasize that over and over and over. After all, In addition to animal suffering, we are trying to prevent or a worsening of our planetary crisis, which is highly related to what we eat. Secondly, I'd say just that daily acts of compassion add up and make a huge difference. And I'd give some examples. Save that spider in your house. Put out water for birds and wildlife when it's hot. Adopt an older animal from a sanctuary or a shelter. Don't go to a horse race. Don't go to an orca theme park show. And I'd add that there are so many ways every single day to show compassion. If you are a cat owner, keep your cat inside, protect the birds and the wildlife, 
The examples are endless. Thirdly, I would say teach your children from the very beginning, whether you're a parent, a grandparent, a friend, a coach, a teacher, all grades and all levels. Teach them that animals want to live, they want to flourish, and we can be better and we can do better for them every day. Barbara, tell our listeners how they can buy your books. Oh, sure. Um, First of all, I have a website. It's www.barbarajking.com. My publisher for the books that we have been discussing, the last three books that I wrote, in fact, is University of Chicago Press, so I'm findable at their website. And I'd also like to invite people to find me on Twitter. I tweet every day about animals and books, and I am BJ King Ape. So that's A P E at the end, BJ King Ape. Ah, uh, appropriate, I suppose. Yes, yes, thank you. It is. <laughs> Uh, Barbara King, thank you very much for being on the PETA podcast. Thank you. I'm very honored to be asked. I'm talking to you wearing a T-shirt from PETA that says, Eat No Octopus. And so I'm motivated by that every day. Animal emotion and cognition expert Barbara J. King, Professor Emerita in anthropology at William and Mary College in Virginia. Her most recent book, Animals Best Friends, putting compassion to work for animals in captivity and in the wild. For more on what you can do for the animals, go to PETA.org and take action. And that's our show for today. Thank you for listening. Don't forget to send a link of this show to your friends. Tell them you like the PETA podcast. You can contact us at PETA.org or find me on Twitter at Emil Amok. That's E-M-I-L-A-M-O-K. Or see my vlog at amok.com or see my work, my writing at ALDEF, the Asian American Legal Defense and Education Fund. That's at A-A-L-D-E-F.org slash blog. Once again, thank you for listening. Check out all our episodes on your favorite podcast app or on Apple Podcasts, where you can subscribe to the podcast or as well as rate and review the show. It helps get the word out about the issues you care about. Our music is provided by Carbon Works. Check them out on YouTube. And join us again next time for more insight into animal rights and the fight for a cruelty-free world on The PETA Podcast. I'm Emil Guillermo.